And, um, and the two main things I want to really address in the lecture now is the um, uh, two very quantum mechanical ideas that uh, not, um, that's not easy to understand from the classical mindset. One is the idea of measurement, which can actually become super mystical if you <laughs> are bent that way. Um, and I want to avoid that as much as possible. Like when you talk about new age people, like I want to stay away from all of that as soon as much as possible. So last Tuesday, I just talked a little bit about uh, measuring position of a particle in an infinite square well. And all of that can be a little bit abstract. So I want to give you a more concrete physical scenario. I don't have a real demo, but I can show you a simulation so that you can see in a real experiment what it would look like. And um, um, the other thing that I really need to go over is the uncertainty principle. There is a natural way to understand it in a way that it kind of makes sense. And that's actually a good chunk of what your lab addresses but I want to set up some kind of stage for that. So on measurement, so this is what we talked about last time so that we are not just coming from vacuum. If we have infinite square well, that is if you have a particle of mass m that's placed inside some uh, potential wall, Never mind how you're building it. If you're actually doing the experiment, you will do it with the electric field. But the idea is that it's a, this particle is confined within some limited region. Because if it goes too far one way, the potential goes to infinity as it's trying to you know, go beyond this. So no matter what, it won't have enough energy to go beyond this. And the same thing happens at the other end. And this is the situation that we call infinite square well. And we looked at the, the wave functions, which can fit in here. That's consistent with the quantum mechanical assumptions that we've been introducing since two weeks ago. So the one example of wave function that we looked at was something that looked like this. Uh, let me draw some pictures that you're going to start seeing a lot. Um, so people like to combine several pieces of information into one drawing like this. Um, one is, so you saw the different energy levels that were allowed, right? So the allowed energy levels, let me see if I can remember. This is how I will best remember it. <laughs> it's uh, kinetic energy, whatever energy you have, it's all kinetic energy. And what's uh, nice here is that momentum has a particular allowed values in it because Momentum was related to wavelength by this relationship. And uh, if we are trying to fit in standing waves here, only certain wavelengths fit. So we do all this as memory uh, aid. I think this is what it ended up being. The allowed energies were um, n squared h squared over 8m l squared, where l would be the uh, width of the well. Like that's what you remember, yes. So um, this can be represented in this diagram this way. I can draw the energy levels. So this would be the, let's say, energy level for the first allowed level. That's the ground state energy. Then looking at this expression, as you change n, the only thing that, well, the only n changes. Everything else is constant. So the next one is at four times the amount of energy of this. So the next one, oh, wow, I drew it, sorry. Let me. Um, I want to try to draw it kind of to scale. So let me <laughs> do it a little bit more carefully here. So this is one unit. So the next one will be four units from the bottom or three units above this. So one, two, three. So this is the next energy level. And I'm not sure if I can draw the next one. Next one is five units above this. So one, two, three, four, five. OK, I think that's the most I can draw on this limited scale. So this is one way of kind of representing the allowed energy levels in this one diagram. I'm kind of making use of the fact that I'm already using the vertical axis to represent the potential energy. So if I'm drawing total energy, it will be same on the same energy scale uh, vertically. And now that you have this as a baseline, the way people like to draw these pictures is use this as the zero x or um, the x-axis. So this is the sort of wave function equals zero line 
for the, the uh, three allowed states that we are going to draw. The, and the wave function that corresponds to this energy level, one that corresponds to this energy level, one that corresponds to this energy level. And we looked at this last time, those wave functions look like, so this is the longest wavelength that fits, this is the next longest wavelength that fits, and this is the next, oops, next longest wavelength that fits, right? And oh, these are all representing the wave function psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. And I'm drawing a snapshot. Over time, this will oscillate up and down, like a, a like, you know, a standing wave. Okay. And what we looked at last time was, so let's say this represents a particle of mass m. This, is rep, this wave function is somehow representing a particle of mass m. Like, uh, uh, how do I do this? Let me do it. <laughs> particle of mass m. Um, and like an electron, and it's a uh, particle so small that we do, it doesn't really have a known size, or it's much, much small compared to this length L. And what I, what I claimed last time is if you were to measure the position of this particle, let's say you prepare it in this state, and you measure its position, you are not going to actually see it spread out all over. You are going to measure it at a particular location the way it ought to be. Um, so like one time, you might measure it here. This is one of the most likely places to be. So you know, that's one of the most likely places you'll find it, maybe. But by almost a random chance, sometimes it'll be here, sometimes it'll be here. And if I draw something that looks like a histogram, so this is what I drew towards the end of the class last time, you'll get this kind of distribution for particle detection. So there are some patterns you can see. As in, when you, um, when, you, when you look at the distribution of, so you have to imagine doing 100 different experiments to build up statistics like this. And when you do that, you see a pattern. Oh, let me not use this color. You see a pattern that particle is mostly like, most likely found at some location, but not only at that location. And then particle is not likely to be found at all at certain, certain locations. They would be like nodes of the standing wave. And this is represented by the psi to absolute squared. And we talked about last time what that absolute squared means. Okay. 